seat belts. When I was teaching navigation, I had this class of 13 young men, and they were wonderful. Come fly with me, we'll fly, we'll fly away. And during, when you were doing this, you were always meeting pilots who had already been flying, mostly in the South Pacific. Come fly with me, we'll fly, we'll fly away. Met one young man who had spent a week on a raft. They had been on, you know, hell of mission. There was no sweet life anywhere where they were. Iris Nig Lundeen taught navigation to some of the brightest and bravest airmen in World War II. Among the greats was a group of men under the command of legendary aviator Major Gregory Pappy Boyington. Pappy Boyington and his crew shot down over 90 Japanese planes. In between missions, Iris helped his men prepare to find their way through the bloodiest of battles. Pappy Boyington was working with mostly tremendous, tremendous fighter pilots because they were in the middle of every hot battle I think that there was. And of course, they lived for the minute. Throughout her service, Iris played a unique role in the history of the Marine Corps Women's Reserve. I was very fortunate in that I ended up as one of the first four women navigators in the Marine Corps. These are my wings. I never wore them on base because to the ordinary observer, they looked like pilot's wings. And I thought, I'm not going through what the pilots are doing at all. When I was off base, I wanted to brag about what the women were doing. So I wore them and so and so and say, are you a pilot? And so I could tell them what we were doing. You know, that's not bragging about yourself. That's bragging about a bunch of people. Iris marched in lockstep Marine Corps history with her pioneer predecessor, Ofa Mae Johnson. Johnson enlisted in World War I, along with 304 others in the Marine Corps Women's Reserve. At this time, their work was confined to mostly clerical duties. Some served as cooks, others as nurses. After the war, Major General Commandant George Barnett issued orders for the separation of women from the Marines. It wasn't until February of 1943 when the official announcement to recruit women was made by Major General Commandant Thomas Holcomb. Major General Holcomb approved the new formation of the Marine Corps Women's Reserve. Thousands of combat casualties across the globe made the recruitment of women in all branches of the armed services a wartime necessity. School teachers like Iris were losing interest in their work and were willing to join. I had been teaching for two years and I was working that summer in Minneapolis and had a little altercation with the place where I was working and I thought, I'm not going to work here, I'm going to go in the Marine Corps. So I walked to the recruiting center and went in. My parents didn't know, I didn't tell anybody, even the man that I ended up marrying, I didn't tell him. She signed up and took a troop train with hundreds of women from Minneapolis to North Carolina. Sitting near her on that same train was a famous athlete who was paving the way for women in golf. Patty Berg, the first woman golfer I've ever made newspaper, was on that train also. After basic training, she attended officer's training, then navigation instruction. Navigation classes were held late at night, leaving almost no time for R&R. We went to school from midnight until 8 o'clock in the morning, and that was pretty bad because you thought you had to live during the daytime, but you also had to go to class at midnight and have your wits about you. Navigation students were training in airplanes that were not always in the best condition. Good planes were in short supply because they were needed in combat. Consequently, students like Iris had to make do whenever she could. I looked out and there was flame coming out of that engine and I thought, oh man, we're on fire. The fellow sitting beside me, oh don't worry, don't worry, it's okay. They were not the best quality planes because they were the remnants of what was needed for fighting. One day we went out and there was a ship standing on its head. It had been sunk. I met a man shortly after that who was in security. And he said, not many people know that within seven miles of the U.S. coast, we have German submarines. So apparently the boat that we saw that was sunk that one day had been sunk overnight. Never made the papers. He said, nobody ever knows that because people in the U.S. would panic if they knew that subs were that close. 
I think you just sort of leave it scared all the time. As a female teacher of male students, Iris says she was always treated fairly and respectfully. There was never anybody who misbehaved. Not ever. You know, I, even out on night once, it was pretty dark, and you were looking at the stars. Nobody tried to get fresh at all. She did, however, witness race discrimination on base. On one occasion in the mess hall, she disagreed with a comment made by a higher ranking officer, and she let him know it. I have never been discriminatory, and I thought one day I was going to get chopped down in rank because we were at the senior mess hall at noon, and that was one smart apple fellow officer, uh, much higher in rank than I was, and he made this smart remark to this young black steward, and it made me so mad, and I just said to him, he probably has more education than any of us put together, and I got up and left the table. And I, after I got away, I thought, I wonder what's going to happen to me tomorrow. But nothing did. When World War II ended in August of 1945, Iris witnessed another war looming on the home front. America's history of racism continued, despite the fact that black military men and women bravely served their country. As she boarded the bus leaving for Minnesota, Iris reflected on the heartless remarks and ridiculous systems of racial separation a system that she says still finds its way into modern thinking over 60 years later. When they called the bus, I went out and I say, I got in the wrong place because I went to the back of the bus and they said, you can't sit here. And I had noticed that there were black only and white only restroom areas and fountains and everything. And I never cared what color you were if you behaved, but I had to move. They wouldn't let me sit in the back of the bus. They thought that because your skin was dark, you weren't smart. It takes people, well, there are a lot of rednecks yet, you know that. I'm sure that there are some in my acquaintance. It's too bad because when you have to fight for skin color, that's ridiculous. But keep on carrying the cross, I guess, and that's it. And eventually people will learn.